I'd have you uh, make out your checks to my defense committee, but uh, <laughs> I'll be out of jail before you can write the check out. So. <laughs> We had a meeting earlier today, uh, speaking to a, a, a media group on the question of is the media biased, and uh, particularly with particular reference to the Middle East. And what I would like to do here today is to discuss the character of our enemy who it is, where it comes from, and what, what's the solution to this problem. The uh, agreement uh, that is in the works between the government of Israel, uh, particularly the, the foreign minister Perez, and Yasser Arafat, is essentially based on the idea that there should be economic development in that area. That is, that there, there needs to be strong construction of canals and power plants and railroads to build up industry and work in that region for the mutual benefit of all the people in that area. That's the basis, the real basis for these accords. And this, I'm not being chauvinistic when I say that this way of approaching a problem, uh, such a terrible division, is a typically American way to approach the problem like that. And it's typically American, particularly if you go back a little bit in American history. And it's typically American, especially if you contrast it to what has been typically British or the British Empire approach, which involves the, the division of people on the basis of race and nationality, the creation of wars in order to con continue to maintain uh, power. Now, it's difficult in our time of ignorance, in our time of uh, acceptance of ignorance as being some sort of natural thing, People don't know any history. They don't feel they need to know any history. They don't know any science. They don't feel they need to know any science. This is a, a, a catastrophe, this ignorance in our country. It's difficult under these circumstances to bring up things, even if they're very important, and even talk about them. Like, for example, Britain. How are you going to talk about Britain in Southern California? Right? That's a, that's a problem, right? Even if you know that it's true and necessary that you talk about that. Really, the, I, I think that the most courageous thing that, that we have to do is to put on the agenda before people for discussion certain kinds of topics that are not on the agenda now, where the media defines the agenda for what's going to be discussed. It's not so much their slant on things. That's not even the problem. Most of the time, they're not discussing an area of a problem at all. It's just not, they don't report the news at all concerning this, let alone the history, the background, or any reasonable approach to it. So here you have this problem. In the Middle East, on February 25th, one or more people went into a holy shrine a holy shrine of the Jewish people, which was also a holy shrine of the Muslims, and systematically assassinated as many people as possible with automatic weapons fire while they were praying. That's what just happened. Hundreds of people were shot. How many died, I, I don't recall. But hundreds were shot. The killers in this atrocity were, of course, trying to break up the peace accords and destabilize the, the region. They were trying to rescue a certain type of British approach to things and subvert an alternative approach that could be 
of great value to the world. Now what, what we need to do is to understand who did that and what are they. If I say that this is the British doing that, you have to understand what that means. That's not just, I mean, it's not some sort of indirect thing that we're talking about here. It's not a slander or a, just a characterization. In a sense, this is similar to, we published a book called Dope Incorporated. And that book took up the question of whatever happened we're trying to understand the dope problem in America when, when we wrote that book, when EIR did that book. And so we studied the question, whatever happened to the old British Empire opium trade of the 19th century when they openly went over and made wars to force countries like China to have opium? Whatever happened to those forms of business, to the shipping companies that did that and so forth? How do they leave that business and get into some, more, some other type of more legitimate business? And the answer was pretty shocking. The answer was they never did leave it, and they are still doing it. They just changed certain formats. They set up uh, banks in different parts of the world, but they still continue to do exactly the same business. Certain new areas were opened up, cocaine and so forth. The same thing applies in this area, that you have a... a long-standing British involvement in the Middle East, which people know something about, and I'm going to get into that tonight, which never stopped, even though the British Empire is not, doesn't seem to be a big deal in the world, right? What's the British Empire, after all? Nothing, right? Went out of existence, more or less. Not really. What's the International Monetary Fund? What are international bankers? What is the international media? I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a simple proposition on the killers at Hebron. There are two ways that you have to understand them. Number one, they are <coughs> representatives of a British party. They're, it's essentially British. And number two, they're gangsters. Now, uh, by gangsters, I mean people who run dope, gun running, uh, prostitution, robberies, murder, etc. And there's a political, uh, there's a political uh, organization of this party within the Jewish community that includes people in very fancy suits. They go by the name of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. And then there's people who wear the clothing of, a, of an FBI provocateur, like Meyer Kahane, who organized terrorist parties in Brooklyn, and they, they're still sending guns and people over to Israel to blow the place up. So, but this is a single party. Now... This is of immense importance to us in many different ways. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'm going to write a word on the board here. There's a company called the Hollinger Corporation, which is a sort of board of directors, in a certain sense, for this party that I'm talking about. The Hollinger Corporation is a newspaper publishing company that, has, that owns many different newspapers and probably other types of media, but the, the news, it's the newspapers that we're primarily concerned about here. This company owns the Jerusalem Post, which is the main English language newspaper in, of Israel, and that in Israel the Jerusalem Post is the mouthpiece for the violent terrorist anti-Arab faction, Ariel Sharon, the former general, the enormously fat general. <laughs> uh, that's, he speaks through the Jerusalem Post. It didn't used to be like that. It was more of a liberal media. Now it's, they call it right wing. But you're missing the point a little bit unless you see the Hollinger Corporation owns it. They also own the Telegraph in London. 
the Daily Telegraph. Uh, they also owned the Chicago Sun-Times. They also owned the Financial Post of Canada, like the Wall Street Journal of Canada. And they own about 80 other newspapers in the United States. This is actually a British and Canadian news, uh, company. Now here's the board of some, of some of the people on the board of directors. Peter Bronfman, who owns the real estate, uh, who manages the real estate operations for the Bronfman family of Canada. Margaret Thatcher, Lord Carrington, and his partner, Henry Kissinger, from Kissinger Associates. David Brinkley, Lord Rothschild, William F. Buckley Jr., whose brother turned down our appeal, and so we have to go to, he's the judge in Washington. Paul Volcker, uh, and Lord Weidenf or Wiedenfeld, who is the uh, head of the Institute for Jewish Affairs in London, which is an Anti-Defamation League front operation over there. Uh, the London Daily Telegraph is the original source, and this corporation is the original source of the Whitewater affair. That is, these people from England and their representatives in Washington began to uh, publish violent attacks on President Clinton at a certain point when he began to question certain British Empire approaches to things, particularly what was going on in Russia. He said, maybe it's not so great that the IMF is saying that Russia should be stripped bare and people should starve and they should deliver all their worldly goods up to international financiers and gangsters. Maybe that won't work. He just questioned it a little bit. And remember, the, the chronology is very important because what Clinton did around the same time as he and Gore both questioned this international liberal establishment program. Pretty wild, right, for Gore to question that? The world is interesting today, right? But it's Clinton first made that, that question. Uh, so he appointed uh, Bobby Inman to be Secretary of Defense who also questions some of these things, and Strobe Talbot uh, to be a Deputy Secretary of State. And Strobe Talbot had said just before that, he was a special ambassador to Russia, he had said, maybe we need a little bit less shock and a little more therapy. Now they were talking about the so-called shock therapy that this crowd has been uh, uh, hitting Russia with. And if you keep backing Russia into a corner by saying you should be poor and starve, that welcome to capitalism, all you're going to do is turn them into an enemy and they've got H-bombs. You want a World War III? That's a good way to get it. Maybe that's not a good plan. <laughs> he said, maybe that's not a good plan. So all of a sudden, both Strobe Talbot and Bobby Inman were accused of what? Being anti-Israel. Didn't have anything to do with what they were talking about. It's not true either. But you get a sense, you begin to get a sense of the party that we're talking about. Now, when I say that we're talking about gangsters, this is not just using that word in some loose fashion. We're talking about, for example, Meyer Lansky. Uh, who is Meyer Lansky? He's dead now, but he, who was he? He was, he was considered the kingpin of the, he was the, the, the lead financier and organizer for organized crime in the United States. He was born in Poland. And there's a book out. In fact, I have this book right here. Can I bring it with me? There it is. Here. Meyer Lansky. It's written by three Israelis. Uh, one of them is Yuri Dan. Uh, these people, the, the authors are, are Israeli journalists who are spokesmen for this party. 
Uh, they are mouthpieces for Ariel Sharon and the violent, extreme, racist, anti-Arab faction in Israel. And what they say in this book, which is entirely favorable to Meyer Lansky, <laughs> is that Lansky uh, heard from his parents in Poland about anti-Jewish attacks that were going on all the time and learned that Jews should fight back against these attacks. So that therefore, because of these attacks, whatever, the, whatever somebody like Lansky does is really morally justified. And it, obviously they're using this to relate to what they're doing, but that's not the only thing. Because you begin to find out that they are closely related to Meyer Lansky in their activities. And you see little incident. If you don't know anything more than it is in, the, in this book, you might not quite figure it out. But, for example, when Ariel Sharon invaded Egypt in the 1967 war, Meyer Lansky's organization sent him a basket of champagne and cigars in Egypt. Meyer Lansky's organization. And that's in the book. What's that all about? Isn't that weird? A general in a war? And he was criticized for doing that, too. He had champagne and caviar and cigars from the Meyer Lansky organization in the middle of his war. <laughs> so how is that related to what we have to deal with in politics? Well, it goes back, again, to this, this problem that you have, that the most important things that you have to discuss with people are things that they don't even think are relevant to anything. I'll give you an example. Any of you go to the movies, ever? Any of you ever watch television? <laughs> if you consider the fact that Hollywood was set up and has been run by killers, by satanic killers, that is, people who murder again and again and again and again, they also set up Las Vegas as a coordinated operation. That after World War II, the British Special Operations Executive, that is the, the secret intelligence service of the British operating out of Canada and England, set up operations for the Lansky mob to launder drug money, to, to, to uh, run things in the Caribbean and to run gambling operations all over the country. And these people directly set up Las Vegas completely. They set up all the lottery operations in the country. Now, they, now this has take, taken on a professional, uh, uh, a professional uh, look to it, with professional corporations involved, supposedly not related to these people. But this is the future of the United States. We're going to be doing nothing but gambling and entertainment. We have gambling, entertainment, sex, perversion, and sports. 25 hours a day and no other industry. You don't have to do any other industry. So the schools will train people to be workers in those industries. Right? If, if, these, if this party uh, predominates. The, uh, the bootlegging, right? the gangsters, the American organized crime is entirely British. In the 1920s, under Prohibition, you have three principal figures setting that up on this end. One of them is Meyer Lansky, who's running operations with his underling, Lucky Luciano, and Al Capone and various people in different parts of the country, especially as you got towards about 1930, completely dominating that. Then you have the Bronfman family in Canada and a guy named Arnold Rothstein, who's in high society and goes over to England, and all of those parts of it coordinate with the lords of England, like General Haig, the head British general in World War I. His family runs Haig Scotch, and he's a partner with Bronfman, a direct partner, not a hidden partner. They had a company, 50-50, right? And the gangsters ran all of this under the complete control of Great Britain. Murder, hijacking, arson, constant murders. The amount of murders that, that were involved in setting up these different things. First, 
uh, the so-called, uh, you know, bootlegging. But then you get into the post-bootlegging operation of these same channels of dope, smuggling, and gambling, and entertainment. All by the same group. And imagine if you say, let's legalize narcotics, that'll solve the problem. Well, wh how much are you going to legalize? You're going to legalize murder, legalize, pro le legalize every element of this whole thing. That's not the solution to it. Now, where does this come from? What's the background of this arrangement? You can begin to get the smell of this if you're, if you're courageous enough, if you go into your own neighborhood and talk to probably even some of your own friends and ask them about the end times. The end times, right? Oh, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. It says so in the Bible. Whoa, God says that the Jews are going to go back to Palestine. They're going to have a war with the Arabs, and that will bring on the end of the world. That's good, because God prophesies that in the Bible, and that's God's will. That's true if God is the same thing as Lord Palmerston. <laughs> So that if you see somebody believing that or telling you that they read about that in the Bible, you have to know enough and be self-confident enough to try to get that person either some uh, uh, sympathetic attention from a professional person, which is yourself, or else at least don't try to get involved in a crazy conversation with them because they're reciting British propaganda. Geopolitics, that's what's called geopolitics. In other words, the religion that's gotten into American Protestants, heavily in the black community, heavily among Baptists, and of course, it's, it, it's a certain heart idea of, the, of Zionism, right, is British Geopolitics. First one who proposed that the Jews need to go back to Palestine was Lord Palmerston, the British foreign minister and later prime minister. In 1840, he sent a letter to the British ambassador in Turkey. Palestine at that time was part of the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire. And Lord Palmerston said, the Jews as a nation desire to return to Palestine. And of course, the, as Abba Ibn pointed out, the Jews didn't, uh, didn't know anything about that at the time. <laughs> the British then sent troops a month later the, for, for the first time and landed them in Palestine. They didn't take it over at that time, but they started to, you know, get involved. Now, after the Civil War, the British set up a very strange organization called the Palestine Exploration Fund. It was set up by Queen Victoria and by the United Grand Lodge of Masons and other people supporting Masonic ideas. What did they do? They went to Palestine, which didn't belong to Britain, it was part of the Turkish Empire, and they started to dig in the city of Jerusalem. Dig for ancient temples. Dig for any ruins that might be put to a certain use by the British Empire. You know, the Masons talk about restoring the Temple of Solomon, and this is what Meyer Kahana and some of these crackpots of the uh, uh, extreme wing in Israel talk about. We've got to restore the Temple of Solomon. And then the, your, your so-called fundamentalists over here will say, yes, once that's restored, then we can have our end of the world. All right? End times. Oh, boy. Uh, why do they want to restore Solomon's Temple? That wasn't the last temple. There were three temples. The last time it got closed down was the, second, was the third temple, not Solomon. Solomon's was the second. Why do they want to restore Solomon's temple? Because I think it might have to do with the fact that Solomon had more than God in his temple. He also had a few pagan gods in there, right? 
read about that. Whatever it is, these guys from Britain went over there in the 1860s, 1870s, and dug way down. The leader of this, the, the head of the Palestine Exploration Fund was a man named Sir Charles Warren, who wrote a book about his experience as the lead, he was an engineer in Her Majesty's Army, wrote a book called Underground Jerusalem, another book called The Temple or the Tomb, and he published a book in the 1870s about uh, proposing the colonization of that section of the Ottoman Empire uh, that the British called Palestine uh, in exchange for uh, taking over Turkey's national debt. Right? And he said, let this be done with the avowed intention of gradually introducing the Jew, pure and simple, who is eventually to occupy and govern this country. It is written over and over again in the word of God. Israel are to return to their own land. It's a British Army guy saying this, right? Uh, okay, so now, who is this fellow? This is Charles Warren. He goes back to England. He takes a few trips to South Africa, spends a number of years killing the natives down there, and shooting some of the Dutch people. And then he goes back in uh, 1886 to London, and he starts a new Masonic organization, and it's called the Quator Coronati Lodge. We still have this area. Now let's write this down for you specialists in the audience. <laughs> Quator Coronati means the four crowned ones. This is a research lodge of the Freemasons, the British Freemasons. By the way, when I say Freemason, I mean British Freemasons, because as of this point in time in the, wor in the world today, there's nothing but British Freemasonry. There is Prince Hall Black Freemasonry in America, which is very quiet and is intimidated by these other guys. But among white people on the whole planet, with a minor exception in France, don't say Freemasonry, say British Freemason, okay? It's British. Anyway, this is a special lodge they set up. This guy was the head of it. He had another job at the same time. He was police commissioner in London. And it just happened at that time that the royal family had a little problem. One, the grandson of the queen uh, married the wrong person, see? And uh, they wanted to cover that up, and she was hustled off to a, an insane asylum, and all the witnesses were killed cut up with Masonic signs all over them. And they said, oh, it's a lone assassin named Jack the Ripper. And uh, it was nice to have a, a police commissioner who was also the head of this lodge, Quator Coronati. Uh, also, they had the assistant coroner who was in the same little group. <laughs> and uh, he lost his job because there was a big uproar about that. But so what? He helped the royal family out, you know. This lodge went on to do very interesting things. They, they produced some new groups in the world. You've heard about some of these groups. One group that they controlled was called the Theosophists. Another group that they controlled was called Astrology. Astrology had been ended in Europe possibly hundreds of years before. There was some little bits of astrology that would float through France, etc., etc. But at least for a hundred years, or much more than that, it was dead in France and Germany. And in the 1890s, the British reintroduced it into Germany and France. Why would they do that? Geopolitics. And these guys write about how they did that and how proud they are of introducing superstition into, into Europe. There was a group called the Order capital O, Order of the Golden Dawn, that was organized by this little group in England, this research lodge, and uh, who are the, the founders and promoters of Zionism also, right, in the sense of, of having actually undertaken this as a project. This group was later run by Alastair Crowley, 
is a pretty famous Satanist who came to Hollywood and helped start Hollywood early in this century. Uh, there was another, th th these guys were running uh, Freemasonic and various occultist things in Turkey to shake things up in Turkey and prepare the way for the Messiah? I doubt it. All right? <laughs> prepare the way for British geopolitical games and, and control the route to India and so forth, right? It's a very strategic area, Israel, right? Palestine, right between Europe, Asia, and Africa. So they had in Turkey all of these crazy uh, false Muslim groups based on uh, uh, the uh, Sufi tradition, run by the British. The B'nai B'rith was there in, in, in great depth, run by the British. <coughs> There was a guy who went down there to Turkey from uh, from uh, Germany and became involved with these British uh, organizations, became a Turkish Freemason there and astrologer named Sabatendorf. I don't know if I spelled it correctly, but he became famous later. He went back to Germany and founded another suborder of this thing called the Tula Society which is uh, the people who taught Adolf Hitler about, about the occult. All run by the British. Uh, Houston Stuart Chamberlain was there in, in uh, living in, in uh, southern Germany and promoting, he married Wagner's daughter and was promoting Nazism for the British. All right, so this is what they were doing. Now, the chief Zionist, in the period right after this, before you actually got somebody doing something about Zionism, was a man named Lawrence Oliphant, a very strange man who was in and out of America as a spy for the British. And uh, he wrote a letter to the Foreign Secretary of England. Now this take this will get you right to your neighbor's problem. By the end times, this is what he said. He said that. Uh, he's a spy. He's a professional spy. His, his uncle is head of the East India Company. He's a personal spy for uh, uh, Lord Palmerston and then for other British uh, governments. He came here and helped the Confederacy to try to break up the United States. He was all over the world doing these various revolutions and stuff. So he wrote to the Foreign Minister of England. He said that we have to set up a Palestine Development Company as the precursor for a, a Jewish state. This guy's not Jewish, right? He's a British aristocrat. He says, most of the immigrants will probably consist of oppressed Jews from Romania and the south of Russia. He's writing this in 1878. He says, financing of this will be easy. Quote, any amount of money can be raised upon it owing to the belief which people have that they would be fulfilling prophecy and bringing on the end of the world. I don't know why they are so anxious for the latter event, but it makes the commercial speculation easy. <laughs> As it is a combination of the financial and sentimental elements which will, I think, ensure success. And you thought that was your religion or your neighbor's religion. You didn't realize that it was this cheap operation by a bunch of British lunatics, right? who say God said it. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> was, they attribute a mass murder plan to God. And people buy it all over the place. Okay, now, this, uh, oh, by the way, this guy actually eventually moved to Palestine when he left a cult in upstate New York. He moved to Palestine, uh, wrote books on why men and women should not have sexual relations, and eventually died of syphilis in Palestine. <laughs> Lawrence Oliphant, a very famous man in the 19th century. Yes, sir. Oh, I have a question. So would, would I be safe to say that the British also controlled the, the activities uh, the Crusaders fighting against the Muslims during the... No, 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 no. You don't, don't try to take the British fact that far. The British problem only starts 
uh, as we're talking about it now, around 1500, 1600. Because before that, there were other people. Like the British didn't start the slave trade or anything like that. England was a fine country in, in, in times past. And it got corrupted. But let's, let's save that for, for later, OK? Uh, you can finish up this, this uh, introduction to the problem with the character of Lord Balfour, B-A-L-F-O-U-R, who was British prime minister at the beginning of this century, <coughs> the same time as Teddy Roosevelt was president and Edward VII was the king. And he was a, complete, uh, a completely insane person. He, he believed in the end times. He believed that the universe would eventually consume the earth, or the sun would, would blow up and consume the earth in a billion years. But that's still going to happen, and therefore, everything man done is, it does is of no value whatsoever. And the universe simply yawns at man. Very strange viewpoint for a human being to have. He proposed that, uh, that Jews should not come to I England. He told this to the parliament that what they need to do is go over to Palestine because we have some use for them over there. He didn't like Jews. And then later on when he was foreign minister in 1917, he was the one who made the famous declaration, the Balfour Declaration, saying the British Empire will look favorably on having Palestine as a homeland for the Jews. He was also the head of the Psychical Research Society. And it was the president of that in England and ran many Americans who were in that, like William James, the so-called father of psychology. Many of these people are wildly insane and are therefore qualified to be psychologists. <laughs> now, what, what is this party that we're talking about? Does this, does this affect us in other than these, these types of areas? Let me... Uh, Let me bring up some California problems. In 1974, 5, 6, I forget what year, there was a young student at Stanford University. Uh, he was 19 years old. He was from uh, North Dakota. His name was Bruce Perry. And he had a lovely young wife, 19 years old, also from North Dakota. She's also a student at Stanford, and they're living in student housing for married couples. And one night, his wife was brutally murdered in the church at Stanford University, in the college chapel. It was a satanic ritual killing, and I'm not going to describe the details. It's very gruesome and disgusting. And it was, it was, the body was arranged in a ritual fashion and so forth. Everybody was totally shocked. The police went to this guy's house or apartment to inform him about the murder. He comes to the door and he's covered with blood. He said it was a nosebleed. And when they tested the blood, supposedly it was not his wife's blood type. The murder was never solved. This Bruce Perry went on to become a famous psychiatrist. He is the head of the Baylor University Medical Psychiatric Operations in Texas. He is a national spokesman for the, uh, for the theory that there is no such thing as satanic ritual crimes. Now, this is extremely uh, perturbing, not only because of what happened to him, but because the murder of his wife became perhaps the most famous satanic crime in American history because it was the opening scene in a book called The Ultimate Evil written by Maury Terry. In that book, Maury Terry, who was a newspaper man up in New York, got on to that murder by interviewing a guy who was in jail for committing some other murders, a guy named David Berkowitz, who had was arrested as the Son of Sam killer in New York City. He'd supposedly killed a bunch of people in New York for no reason. He said, supposedly told the press, my, uh, uh, there, was a, there was an evil dog who told me to do this. Well, then when they got into interviewing him, he said, well, actually, I took the fall for this group that I'm in. It's called the Process Church of the Final Judgment. 
the process hyphen church of the final judgment and he said he told Maury Terrio by the way this woman Arliss Perry was killed by people when she by in this cult when she interfered with what they were doing and Charles Manson was in it too and his whole ideology comes from this now what is this what is this thing this is a British group that came over from England to America in the 1960s and it's still around headquartered now in Canada but this was uh, a satanic cult and this guy Bruce Perry whose wife was killed by them is now a lecturer for the cult awareness network and he spoke at their November conference in Minnesota as an expert on what happened at Waco Texas the reason he knew all about that was that the FBI hired him as their expert on David Koresh because he is an expert on satanic or not excuse me on sex crimes against children has experience with that, huh? Yeah, he has a lot of experience in this field of some type. I don't say anything about what his what happened to him. I don't know. Was he in on his wife's murder? I don't say that. I just know that he's now protecting those who killed his wife. The interesting thing about this is that when you dig a little bit behind these organizations, you find that the cult awareness network is run by the same people who run the, the satanic cult. The same people. There's a group of foundations and law firms in New York City that fund the Cult Awareness Network and the American Family Foundation. And the same people are the lawyers and protectors and interveners for the, cult, the, the uh, process church uh, of the final judgment. Just an idea of what they, what they say to their uh, kids that they get involved in this. When they first came over from England, they said there were three gods. Uh, Jehovah, Lucifer, and Satan. That got to be too complicated. I guess people have a lower attention span, you know, in later times in America, so they dropped Lucifer. He's not as interesting. So you just have Jehovah and Satan. And this is the format that's in their magazine. It's published. On a, it was published on a monthly basis. That... God is going to end the world, the sinful world, and Satan is going to execute the final judgment, right? And therefore, if you serve Satan, you're serving God. Hey, is there, is there anything wrong with that? Doesn't that fit in with the end times? Who would, who would assassinate mankind in a war? Who would deliberately cause a war that would result in the mass extermination of human beings? Satan would do that, right? You can't blame that on God. And that's your end times, right? Pretty sick, right? Pretty silly. And yet some people attribute that or say that that is fundamental to Christianity. Isn't that wild? Now, where, where, does, that, where does that really get you? Where, what are you looking at when you look at that? We've had a really rough century. You know, we've had a rough century. You go back uh, to World War I, completely senseless war. World War II, massive bloodbath, unprecedented in human history, at least in Europe anyway. And then you have the threat of nuclear annihilation in the times that we're all alive. And a uh, pretty dangerous time right now, right? With uh, people running around murdering people in church or in, in while they're praying, right, in mass, to try to provoke something. Let's see what this party has been doing in this. I would point your attention to a house, single house. It goes by the name of Thorpe Lodge. This is a house in England. And a, a, a gentleman named uh, Peregrine Wursthorn grew up there. 
A gentleman <laughs> of the highest type. I have to spell it right here. And he had a mother one time named Priscilla. I probably haven't spelled it right. She married a man who became Peregrine Worstorn's stepfather, a guy named Montague Norman. And this was his house. That, so this is where Worstorn became a, a, you know, a mature individual and so forth. Montague Norman is famous as being the head of the Bank of England for 24 years, from 1920 to 1944. Longer time than anyone else. Anybody else has just been head for two years. Before he was head of the Bank of England, he was a partner of Brown Brothers Banking Company. And that later merged with uh, Harriman, to become Brown Brothers Harriman. Oh, but his family firm was called Brown Brothers. And the Brown Brothers man from New York would come to Thorpe Lodge early in the century and meet with Montague Norman. They'd discuss theosophy and various <coughs> occult religions. That uh, he was an, uh, Montague Norman was a theosophist. By the way, the reason I, this is quite uh, relevant now is that Peregrine Worstorn is like the central character in the Holl Holl Hollinger Corporation writes for the Daily Telegraph. He virtually personally launched the whole Whitewater thing against uh, Clinton. He also uh, was the one who declared that Germany is going into a Fourth Reich and needs to be smashed. Not Hitler's Germany, because his father put Hitler into power. This democratic Germany needs to be smashed, right? So. In the 1930s, a guy named uh, Hjalmar Schacht used to come to Thorpe Lodge all the time. He was the economics minister of Adolf Hitler. And he'd come to Thorpe Lodge, meet with Montague Norman, daddy, and discuss the budget of Nazi Germany. Well, how are we going to carry on for the next uh, six months in Nazi Germany? Oh, great master head of the Bank of England who runs all world finance and who has given the Nazi German army, all of our weapons, our tanks, and our machine guns, sold by British companies that you personally control, that you personally reorganized in the German marketplace until Hitler got to be sufficiently well-armed that uh, he could carry on. And of course, his family firm, Brown Brothers Harriman, Abraham Harriman, George Bush's father, and other people, partners of that Anglo-American firm, paid the Nazis as they're coming up to becoming a power, the Nazi party. So this is the pro-Hitler faction inside of England. There are people who don't appreciate Hitler in England. He, Montague Norman, convinced the various people within the British government that they should go along with Hitler. So these, this is the fanatically pro-Hitler faction, not pro-German, because he figured that Germany would be weaker under Hitler than a democratic Germany, which was considered to be a threat, because they might become a strong country, a stable country, allied with other strong countries like Russia, China, Italy, etc. Then what would happen if the whole world was a bunch of strong, independent countries? Why would you need international bankers to do any particular thing? All right? Why would they have any power? Well, why am I telling you all this? Uh, just complete on this, on the, on the question of the, the, the mental manipulations. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a group of foundations in, in New York City representing Rockefeller and Harriman. One of them is called the Macy Foundation, mm -hmm. Josiah Macy, uh, and a few other little firms in, 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 in New York. And they're the ones that now control the funding of the uh, Cult Awareness Network and the Process Church of the Final Judgment. In those days, they were sending money over to Germany and Austria to set up psychiatric institutes to preach uh, race purification, various forms of racial extermination, and so forth. Money coming through this and from Rockefeller Foundation, all of it controlled by this guy. 
head of the Bank of England was constantly coming back and forth to New York to coordinate this stuff. Now, oh, there's a Jewish bank involvement. It's the Warburgs who, who coordinated the, uh, the activities of uh, Harriman and this firm in Germany. In this book, They describe, Lansky describes, because Lansky speaks in this book all the time. This is mainly quotes from Meyer Lansky, a great genius of organized crime. He says that in 1935 there was a judge in New York State, a prominent man in the Republican Party, who came to him and says, Meyer, we need to fight Nazism, and you're the man to do it. We're going to give you all the money and legal help that you need and go fight the Nazis. Pretty weird, right? The head of organized crime? And then he went out, supposedly, and, and had his thugs go in and engage in uh, fist fights with brown shirts, the German-American Bund. And they had, they'd had fist fights that got on, on the news. Well, the judge was a guy named Proskauer, and Proskauer was actually in the American Jewish Committee. And they, that was this party that we're talking about. In other words, these are the people, they made public statements attacking my father and others who were in the boycott against Nazi Germany. It was, these were the, this is the pro-Hitler faction of finance, including the B'nai B'rith and the American Jewish Committee. So these are the people who are supposedly paying Meyer Lansky to fight Nazism. But they didn't want Jews to fight Hitler. They didn't want boycotts against Hitler or anything like that, because they're working with the whole British party that's actually putting Hitler into power. So how'd this all end up? How did somebody like Baruch Goldstein, this guy who killed all those people while they were worshipping, get to be so crazy with racial hatred that he would do something like that? It's not based on religion. Because this gang didn't get religion until a certain point. They said, well, that would be useful for our, our faction. So they adopted this religion at a certain point. They got to be so-called conservatives or orthodox or something. And, uh, most of them are, are, old, are former, uh, uh, either former communists or they're mainly uh, uh, anti-Western types from Russia, like, uh, the, like Dostoevsky. Well, what happened is at the end of World War II, there was a certain kind of a project to make people as crazy as possible about what had just happened in World War II. And there was a final meeting at Thorpe Lodge. Now remember, Montague Norman was a theosophist, the principal architect of the Hitler regime, and in fact, of the psychiatry that was practiced under Hitler, where they started killing people and training murderers. These were psychiatrists that were coordinated by Anglo-American people. At the end of the war, they had a meeting at Thorpe Lodge to set up what was called the World Federation for Mental Health. The most insane people that had ever walked the face of the earth, right? They set this thing up, and that's the, it, it, what they did there in 1948 is the basis for all mental health and psychiatric organizations today on this planet. One of the meetings they had there was a meeting on the subject of guilt and how to manipulate guilt, how to, how to use guilt. They had a specific session on German collective guilt. And uh, they, off of that, they, they, they published a book called The Authoritarian Personality. That was published by Proskauer and the American Jewish Committee. That is, the pro-Nazi group in America and Britain published the literature telling you about the guilt of the German people for, for the crimes of Hitler. The, 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 uh, the keynote speaker at that conference on German collective guilt was Margaret Mead. And the chairman of the meeting was the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry's uh, Insanity Project. Project on Insanity, run by Scottish Rite psychiatrists. 
and he's over from America. So this is a bunch of British ghouls and they're American hangers-on. They had, uh, Carl Jung was at, was a vice president of this Congress. Uh, mm -hmm. Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, was, was a vice president. Uh, all the leading uh, uh, British people in the eugenics movement and all the leading British people dealing with uh, the so building up the Soviet Union, because right after the end of World War II, they didn't have Hitler anymore, so they had to have some new dictatorship in Europe, so Europe wouldn't be republic-oriented, so they brought in communism into half of Europe. That was done by the same group of people, by Harriman, remember? Harriman was the ambassador to Russia. He arranged the Yalta meeting and this whole little clique. So they're, 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 they just brought in a new type of totalitarianism. Now, what we need instead of this party running the world or running these terrifying games in the world is what I said at the beginning was the American approach to these things. What Perez and Arafat are working on or were working on before this massacre, which is the, the concept of ec massive economic and industrial development in that region. Now, can you put that on the table for discussion for people? Oh, well, it's, that's not on the agenda. We're into something else today. We're into end times, we're into environmentalism, all these different concerns, right? Not the American system of economics of the 19th century. Who ever heard of that? Well, I'll give you a hint. Who heard of it? The Irish heard of it. There was a man named Arthur Griffith, who was the head of the Sinn Féin party, the Irish Nationalist Party in 1920 and he died about 1922 I think but he was actually president of Ireland for a little while he was a, a real fighter and he wrote a book about European affairs uh, to try to educate Irish people about what's really going on in the world and he said in this book in our century now he said that Henry Carey who was Abraham Lincoln's e uh, economics teacher created the modern American nation. And that Friedrich List, who was a friend of Carey and was involved with very now very obscure types, Friedrich List, a German, created modern Germany. This is this Irish leader in 1920. He also said that the British ran the French Revolution. Not the Illuminati, the British. Don't give me any Illuminati. How come the Illuminati didn't overthrow the British government if they're so interested in overthrowing governments and being communists and so forth? And he said that the British Secret Service paid the Free Trade Party in every country in the world to say their nonsense about free trade. The British prohibited imports of manufactured goods into England and dump their trash on other countries to sell it and undermine their manufacturing in every other country while preaching free trade. Until at a certain point in the middle of the last century, a lot, certain countries in Europe wouldn't buy it. And so the British had to change the law in England just enough to convince the other people that free trade was on the agenda. And a lot of other things this Irish guy is writing about in our century. Arthur Griffith. You can find him in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but they won't write what he said. They'll just tell you that he existed and he was famous and president and so on and so forth. But gosh, people in, in as, as, as long, uh, not so long ago as 1920 still knew about these things. People in America today know something about the British. For example, they know that there are people in America called Anglophiles. And they have some pretty bad attitudes about things, race attitudes or aristocratic attitudes or anti-Christian attitudes or what have you. They don't necessarily put the one and the two together. 
They don't know today what people knew in the 19th century, or they, even if they see it, they don't want it to register because they say, well, how could I tell anybody else about this? So I read it and I forget about it. A simple fact that was known in the 19th century, that Adam Smith, the original of Michael Milken, <coughs> who said that economics is just about getting rich, and that's all there is to it. You, you, know, you set up your system so that people can get rich who are able to, and that'll, be the, that'll work out for the best, and that's all economics is about but that in the 19th century people knew that Adam Smith represented despotism, tyranny, reactionary politics, oligarchism, force, British Navy bombarding ports of people and so forth and setting cities on fire like in China and so forth. That's what was known and understood in the 19th century and that freedom had to do with having your own powerful government. Your government, not owned by some foreign bank or some foreign power, but owned by your people, and it has its own bank, for example, like the Bank of the United States set up by Alexander Hamilton. This kind of an idea in opposition to the British satanic idea about what man is all about was understood in the 19th century and it's forgotten about or, or, or excused from the memory today. So I would propose, now finally, to, to conclude here, and then I'd like to have an interchange here. I would propose that the solution to this problem of the end times is not to destroy the world and to destroy mankind, as some people think God wants to do, wrongly, because it's the British Empire that wants to do that, or that, what, that wants to talk about that. But rather, that we should do what God did at Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> which is finish off this end times party. What party? The end times party, the people who are preaching the extermination of mankind. This gang, like this guy Baruch Goldstein, like Henry Kissinger, like Lord Carrington, like Lady Thatcher, like George Bush. <coughs> This is a party, Meyer Lansky party, the people who set up Hollywood. Hollywood as an institution and this party of gangsters. You, got, you have to count the number of bodies, dead bodies, piled up by the hundreds in the establishment of Hollywood and of Las Vegas and of what is being proposed to you for your future by this party. I would say instead that we go back, take a trip to Israel sometime, and you'll see by the Dead Sea, there's a, a, a little site, and you may see a sign, like a road sign or what have you, where Sodom and Gomorrah were. Now, if you look down, as the bus comes over the ridge, you look down in the valley next to the Dead Sea, it looks like God smashed up this area real hard. It just looks just like that. <laughs> it's in the Great Rift Valley. The whole thing was shaken up all the way down to Africa. And in Hebrew, the words are Sodom and Gomorrah, which means closed and finished. And they don't mean the world. They're talking about those guys. We need to finish off this party to close this party that we're talking about so that spell mankind can live. What's the name of that party? What's the name of the party? Spell it. Uh, the British Empire. <laughs> British, I'll be more specific. British empiricism. Empiricism. In other words, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a very serious question. What is it, what's, a, what's a way that you can identify this generally? Well, you can identify this in many fields. It's not just a group. It's a way of thinking also. Up until about 1815, Sir Isaac Newton was considered to be a fraud, cheap. He's called an empiricist, right? That used to be another word for atheism. If you were an empiricist, that meant that you didn't believe, you didn't even pay any attention to any 
deeper cause of anything than what you saw or perceived with your senses. And so you're obviously a charlatan in science. But after that period, when you have these characters taking over our universities, and you have the proliferation of British Freemasonry and, and various forms of corruption in, in culture, you have all kinds of things presented to people as if they were scientific and great until in the 20th century it becomes totally laughable and people are embarrassed to even talk about these things. For example, Picasso becomes an, a great artist at a certain point. He actually was a decent second-rate artist at a certain young age and then he started making these crazy things on the paper and was promoted by these guys, these uh, 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 oligarchs, these British characters. It's music the same way. Do you ever hear so-called modern, serious music? Completely insane, deliberately insane, deliberately insulting to the human mind, to, to human emotions, so forth. And they say it as if it were the same category of event as Beethoven. Not to speak of, you know, satanic rock music. In every field, particularly in, in physical science, in, in, in uh, uh, the uh, in the sciences of of uh, physics and other other areas completely degenerate laughable activities in the 20th century are promoted as if they were serious and then of course you have the british empiricist line that's drawn that says that science and religion must be always separated from one another whereas the classical scientists the ones who made all the great discoveries were always deeply religious people so, British empiricism, this way of saying that you should take a cheap view of the world. Life is cheap. Uh, uh, labor should be cheap. Don't spend too much time and effort on doing philosophy when you're going to deal with science. Just pick up what the senses say and publish something. And kill the scientists who are deeper thinkers or destroy their reputations. That's British empiricism. And the, and the correlative for that in politics is this party. Uh, you have uh, uh, the specific group that's involved in the Hebron massacre. You have two political parties in Israel that were just banned by the Israeli government. One's called the Kah Party, and the other uh, the other one is called uh, Kahana lives, or Kahana High, after Meyer Kahana. And the, the Prime Minister of England, while they went, of, uh, of Israel, when they banned these parties of the terrorists, of the Jewish terrorists, they said that the problem primarily of these groups is in the United States, is in New York, in Brooklyn. And they wished that the U.S. government would do something about these people. There's thousands and thousands of people like this in, in, in Brooklyn with machine guns. They're in, they, they get their money from gangster activities, and the diamond trade and dope smuggling. They're political provocateurs and they're deep, deep racists. And the Prime Minister of Israel said, Judaism spits on these people. Pretty strong language, right? Well, if he says that, at least what we can do is investigate these people and say, let's, let's try to clean up this party. In the business world, this party is represented by, and in the political world, in the more uh, respectable so-called political world, this party is represented by the Anti-Defamation League, ADL. And if you want to clean up this party, you have to close down the ADL. Are you saying that these very secret societies have been creating these institutions all over the world to create illusions, to mis mislead uh, uh, man on a global basis to keep, to keep different people fighting 
shovel instead of looking at the real source? No. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying something much more specific than that. What you just said is what you can pick up from a thousand different conspiracy buffs, a thousand different little newspapers, a thousand different Freemasonic organizations, most of them who are doing exactly what we're talking about. What I say is the following, that for the last 500 years, we're just limited to that, there are two opposing ways of looking at mankind and two opposing ways of organizing the affairs of the people. One way is most strongly exemplified by the British Empire. They do things in one way. The other way is the American Revolution and the Union side in the Civil War. <clears throat> Everything that you have been taught in recent times is to try to avoid looking at the world that way. The British Empire at the time of the American Revolution, what kind of business were they in? What did they do? What was their economic activity of the British Empire? Trade. Trade. They were trade. They, they, they talked about trade. They had ships that would bring things from one place to another. They were also in the insurance business. What was their what did they sell? Well, one thing that they sold was slaves, black slaves. They had a company called the Royal African Company. It was founded by the Duke of York, and they used to brand the slaves D.Y. They also got into opium sales, and that became bigger later on. But they were doing that already at the time of the American Revolution. They would also uh, corner the market in certain commodities and take them from somebody cheap and sell them at a higher price somewhere else by somehow rigging something the best that they could. And that was their whole mode of operations. In other words, forms of criminal activities. Now, sometimes today, you'll get some crackpot who will say, you can't judge people in those days by today's standards. Why not? Today's standards are a lot worse than they are than they were then. <laughs> what are you talking about? These guys run the place now more than they did then. At least then we had a fight against that. Because in those days they were looked on as criminal. This, nobody ever thought the slave trade was a decent thing to do. It was a criminal activity. Everybody knew that. That was one side. Now let me I want, I want this to be crystal clear so there's no way to escape from it, okay? There was a revolution against that in the colonies. Who were the leaders of that revolution? Well, according to the communists, according to Jefferson Davis, and according to the British, all three of whom say exactly the same thing, the leaders of the American Revolution were a bunch of slave owners and slave traders. Right? All of the, 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 the southern secessionists the Communist Party and the British Empire all say exactly the same thing. And it's picked up on a lot of popular radio stations and so forth, and a lot of rap artists and so forth. The American Revolution was led by slave owners and slave traders. Okay. Supposing that's not true, then what? Then you've got a real bad problem on your, on your hands, don't you? You've got a real bad problem. You might have to pay attention to history. It might mean something to you, instead of just being a big ripoff. Oh, well, we don't have to learn anything about history because it's just a big rip-off. The world is a big rip-off. Don't you know Satan runs the world? No, Satan doesn't run the world. God runs the world. Who's God? Which God? The God that created the world. I don't know what his proper name is, but I know that there's a God who created this world. Well, you believe oh, in magic. Huh? All right, now, there was an alternative to the British Empire, and it goes all the way back to the Renaissance. Three principal leaders of the American Revolution. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton. Take the revolution from the time of the, the formation of the organization, led by Franklin, all the way through the Constitution, principally led by Hamilton. Start with George Washington. George Washington, and these are the three principal leaders of the organization of our country, at the beginning. The, the, the war against England, and the creation of a national government. 
Start with George Washington, the most important Southern politician we've ever had. All right? Don't tell me about Jefferson Davis. George Washington is the most important Southern politician. Anybody who says the Confederacy represents the South is, is coming from the standpoint of British Freemasonry. George Washington, you couldn't get more Southern, he inherited a slave plantation, right? Born in the South, born in Virginia. What did he dedicate himself to do? To undermine and replace a worldwide British system of slavery. The whole world was a slave system in the British Empire way of thinking. What was his idea? He said, instead of having the cheapest possible labor and the cheapest possible raw materials that we grab from somewhere and sell somewhere else, and that's what we were supposed to do according to Adam Smith, what George Washington said is, let us have canals. He personally did the route for the Erie Canal. He led the fight for a canal out to the Ohio. He said, let us grow uh, corn and wheat. Let us have fisheries. Let us have roads. Let us build industry. And let us have a war against the British Empire because we've got to have a modern society. His, his, uh, his uh, uh, farewell address was an address against listening to intriguers who would want to have secession. Okay, that's George Washington. Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton, the two of them, were the originators of the anti-slavery society in the United States. A Alexander Hamilton, born in the West Indies, the son of unmarried parents, not an aristocrat, possibly of black ancestry came to America and had a program for opposing the British world slave system. Because he hated slavery. He saw it all around him in, in the Caribbean. And he did something that the British never forgave him for, never forgave America for. He set up a national bank of our country, a bank of the Republic, the Bank of the United States, which he personally controlled as Treasury Secretary for Washington. And what's the idea of that? Well, if there are international bankers that charge 10, 20% interest, no problem. You have your own bank that charges 3% and gets loans out to people who want to build industry and farming. And what's the purpose of industry, according to Alexander Hamilton? And this gets back, again, to the, the, the fight with these guys. What's the purpose of having industry and industrial development and technological progress? As he defined it in his report on manufacturers, he said, the purpose of having this industrial development is to have the human mind improved. Because if we live in a natural society, that is a peasant society, where people keep their place in nature, and their place vis-a-vis -vis the aristocrats, then each man is an idiot. Each man is maintained as an idiot by his superiors. So therefore, how, how do you change that? By having variegated, various, thriving, com constantly new industries of a powerful industrial type with hundreds and thousands and millions of companies and private farms. And you do that in a country that create, gets power from that, and you have many countries that have power. And any country can do that and have their own national bank and therefore not have international bankers dictating to that country. That's the basis for nationalism of a positive type. Now, if anybody says that these people were the slave party or slave owners, and that defines them, not only is it a lie, but it's coming from the British, who were the inventors, at least in our modern times, of the slave system. Yeah. Getting back to the national bank system, I was talking to someone about that today. How long, like, say you make the conversion, all right? Get rid of the IMF type of institutions, and you start making sovereignty out of all these countries in the world, right, with their own national banking. How long w would a, a transformation of that kind of process take for, a, like, say, a country like Russia, for instance, or Africa? If you wanted to implement that after, you know, people accepted it and said, well, now let's do this national banking graph. Well, LaRouche uh, had a question similar to that at the conference uh, in Virginia, right after he got out of jail. 
He said, supposing I were elected president, I wouldn't have to even take office, and half of this would be accomplished. Because people all over the world are sitting there with wet diapers fearing what's going to happen to them if they take action that they should take to defend their country. People are getting assassinated and having their governments overthrown just about every day for, a, for trying to do something for their own country. I'll give you an example. S Somalia, that we sent our troops there to help feed people. Uh, if we had just not had the IMF there overthrowing their government when they tried to oppose the IMF, when they tried to build some dams or have some nationalist program, that would have, that would have been helpful to start with. In other words, you have nation after nation trying to take an initiative. Nigeria is taking initiatives now. Sudan is taking initiatives now. They're being hit. You can read this in the Los Angeles Times. Read about Sudan. I'm sure you'll find this in your local paper. I haven't read it, but I know you'll find it there. Right? The Sudanese are violating human rights. All right? Well, what are they doing? Well, they had Helga Zeppelarouche there speaking and addressing a conference. That's a, that's a big violation of human rights right there, obviously, right? <laughs> uh, Malaysia. This is a terrible violator of human rights, right? They're, they have a harsh, feudalistic dictatorship. They also have all the national leaders subscribe to EIR. That's a terrible violation of human rights right there. Russia. Supposing any serious force in, our, in the West, like, say, the President of the United States, were simply to suggest to Russia, just suggest it, that Russia should do and would can do with our blessing what we did to become a power and not what the, the Harvard geniuses are telling them they should do, but just do what we did. Every railroad in America was built with government financing. Not just Lincoln's railroads, the national railroads, they were built with federal government money straight out. But the local railroads all over the country, cities and states would finance them. That wasn't the most efficient way to do it. It wasn't communism. That was the American system. You had a partnership, public and private. We, how come we have steel mills in America? We didn't have them before Lincoln. Why did we suddenly start building steel mills? Because we used to buy cheap British steel. The government put a 50% tariff in, Abraham Lincoln's government. How come we have so many private farms? Whereas a lot of countries, you either have communist collectivism or you have big landowners and only a few, you know, the, the little guy has almost nothing. How come we have so many private farms, family farms, or we used to? How did we get that? You had a strategy by people who at various times got themselves in power in our government like Henry Clay, or Alexander Hamilton, or Abraham Lincoln, some other people. And their strategy was, let's make sure that the price of federal land that's sold to families for a farm is just the right price so that individual family farmers can afford to get it and big corporations won't buy it all up. Lincoln thought that wasn't going fast enough, so he said, let's just give it to them. If you are a, if you are a private if you're a, pr a private person, 21 years old, age or older, or the head of a family, you get a quarter square mile of land for free. And we'll, we'll loan you the money to make sure you can build a house on it. That was the American system. We had hundreds of thousands of farms set up that way, and millions of farms set up in similar ways. In fact, black, predominantly black regimes in South Carolina and Mississippi and elsewhere after the Civil War, run by black people, had similar programs for white and black in those states before they were killed off by the Ku Klux Klan. That's the American system. That's how we built up our country. Anything modern here comes from that approach. We tried to do some of that in the 20th century, too. We had the TVA. We had the Kennedy Space Program. We have public airports and so forth and so on. Not communism, but the government has a certain role to play. Your nation has a certain role to play. It's the idea of a nation. All we have to do is just suggest, and that's what... Clinton just began to question the opposite thing a little bit, and he got slammed. And all the Republicans jump on the bandwagon, right? But if you have this proposal on the table, as LaRouche has been making ever since, right? Going back to 1975 when he went to Iraq 
at the invitation of the ruling party there and proposed Arab-Israeli cooperation on the basis of massive industrialization in the Mideast and Kissinger slammed him and threatened murder to anybody who went along with it. That just has to be put on the agenda. And what, as Martin Luther King said, you have to never let them rest. And that's the way you win. You go after the enemy, this, these guys, never let them rest and put the real agenda on the table and you win. That's what, that's what has to be on, yes. One, one, yes. one point of clarification Please. I'd like you to comment on if you would, please. Uh, it, to see if I understood what you were saying at one point when you talked about it. Uh, two or three times, approximately, you, I got the impression you were equating as to one point. Uh, British, uh, British teachings here about end time stuff and the word fundamentalism was used uh, about end time teaching, you know, about both of those need to be squashed. But actually, fundamentalism teaches 100% uh, opposite. They teach that Christ comes back to stop man from destroying himself and sets up a millennial reign for a thousand years, which cannot be a destroyed earth. And so it's just the opposite. That is fundamentalism. I wonder if it's proposed. No. I mean, aside, terminology aside, what he's saying is true, that, that, th that, the, that this so-called end times doctrine of the Masons and, uh, and of the British Empire has nothing to do with Christianity, that people who believe in, in a second coming of Christ based on, on the teachings of the founders of the Christian faith have a different viewpoint, and it's also part of the Jewish faith. They, they, they claim that the Messiah hasn't come yet, but the concept of a future time when mankind will have a, will have a better life, based on 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 a Messiah, based on on God's grace to mankind, is the opposite. Is clearly the opposite from somebody who's saying that God is going to destroy humanity. Really, from the standpoint that God hates mankind and thinks that mankind is not worth having. It's obviously a, it's clearly a completely opposite concept. Yes. Sir. Getting back to slavery, where did the debt slave traders figure into this? You know, for the literature that's commonly available, I mean, the Dutch slave traders got here before uh, Columbus, and it's always Dutch, 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 Dutch. Uh, actually, you had in in uh, just to illustrate that you had in in New York State had significant slavery. Uh, as a, as a col colonial uh, state, and I think right even a little bit after the revolution too. This was Dutch. It was the Dutch influence even after the British were there. Uh, their, their depot for the slaves was Curaçao, and much of the uh, Caribbean was under, under this Dutch influence. There was a lot of uh, uh, Jews that had fled from uh, uh, Spain or had been kicked out of Spain and Portugal and had gotten somehow into the Dutch Empire and were in this slave trade. They were, they were not, they were, they were carrying out the Kabbalistic religion. But both Holland and England were actually latecomers in this trade. They did not invent the slave trade. The, the slave trade originates long before there are any blacks in the slave trade. That is, the European trade in slaves starts off with the Roman Empire, with uh, various types of, of large slave operations. And then you have the Venetians, Ven the city of Venice, which is entirely based on occultism and the slave trade, set up by people who were in the slave trade in Rome going to Venice. Venice, Italy, is in many respects the originator of the British Empire, as, as the, what we're talking about tonight. And they're also the originator of many of these concepts of the so-called secret societies. That is, their idea of trade and of business is the, uh, to, to have the cheapest possible labor, to have weak governments everywhere constantly infiltrated by their agents, and to run the world on the basis of banking, secret agreements, and secret government. There's never any constitution or any transparent government. These people in Venice, at a certain point, lost the physical power of their empire, very similar to, to Britain later on. And so what they did at a certain point was to send Venetian uh, 
bankers, diplomats, and various types of Venetian agents into Holland and England, and eventually took complete power in those countries.